support, you say that the benefit system is broken. Can you tell me in what way the system is broken and for who? We currently have about two and a half million people who have a health condition or a disability um, who are claiming out-of-work benefits and the main out-of-work benefit at the moment is something called Employment and Support Allowance or more commonly known as ESA. Now that number, that two and a half million, has barely changed in over a decade and yet we have had successive governments who have said that getting more people with disabilities into work has been a priority. At the moment the employment gap for people who have disability um, versus those who, who don't have a disability is about 30 percentage points. So what we're saying is the current benefit system is actually getting in the way of achieving the outcomes we want to see which is more people with health conditions with disabilities in the workplace. In the report, you're recommending a package of reforms. What does this include? So what we're saying is you can't pick and choose parts of the benefit system to tweak, essentially. You have to look at the whole system and how it works together, and you have to reform the whole system. But how we've gone about it is by breaking it down into three parts. So first of all, it's the rate. So how much money do you pay a benefit claimant? The second part is access to the benefit, which is commonly called the gateway. And finally, the third part is around conditionality. So that is, what requirements does the government place on claimants in return for them receiving benefits? Uh, collectively, we feel that, that if the government did all of these reforms, the package we're recommending, they would be able to deliver better outcomes. So why are you proposing a single outlet benefit? So at the moment there are different rates for different people within the benefit system. So if you're unemployed, you're a job seeker, then you receive JSA, which is around £73 a week. If you're out of work because of a health condition or you're suffering from an illness or you have a disability, you will be on ESA, which is paid either at a rate of £102 a week or at the slightly higher rate of £109 a week. So that's a huge difference between the amount you get if you're unemployed versus out of work on a sickness benefit. For some people, particularly with severe conditions, the amount you get paid in benefits is unlikely to have any type of behavioural impact. But when we actually looked at the international evidence, what we found is that actually for, for some people with health conditions and disabilities, it will have an impact. And the higher the rate, the longer they're likely to stay on the benefit or indeed claim in the first place. What we're saying is that actually there should be a new model where there is just a single out of work payment. So regardless of why you're out of work, you just receive the same amount. And what we're saying is those savings that you would make from reducing the rate currently in ESA down to around about the job seekers allowance rate should be reinvested to help people with health conditions or disabilities hopefully move closer to the workplace. There are two areas we want to see reinvestment. Firstly, there is an extra cost benefit called personal independence payment, and that's designed to help contribute to the additional cost that someone with a significant uh, disability and a long-term disability may incur due to that disability. We want to see higher rates of that, so we're saying reinvest a lot of the savings into those extra cost benefits. The second area we want to see some of the money being recycled into is in employment support services. So we know at the moment employment programmes are not quite working for people with health conditions and disabilities. We believe that investing more in those services to get better uh, provision will lead to better outcomes for disabled people. You're proposing a single rate benefit. Will anyone be worse off from this proposal? So it is likely that some people will be financially worse off from this proposal. So we're saying you should reinvest, or government should reinvest all of the savings into other mechanisms for supporting people with health conditions and disabilities. Um, if we take the first uh, reinvestment mechanism, which is the person independence payment, um, we found out uh, in our research that around 70-ish percent of people who are on the highest rate currently of ESA, so they're people in the support group in ESA, are also in receipt of um, the extra cost benefit. So obviously that means that almost 30% of people are not in receipt of that. So in recycling the money into that benefit, some of the people who will have lost via the reduced rate uh, in ESA won't be compensated via uh, personal independence payment or disability living allowance. 
However, those people will benefit from the additional investment in the support services. So um, this will allow government to provide much better, much more personalised, hopefully much more intensive programmes of support to help that group of people, indeed all ESA claimants, to move towards the workplace and then hopefully move into work and then sustain that employment. So financially, yes, there may be some people who are worse off, but what we hope this package of reforms will achieve is far more people moving into work, which will be good for them and obviously good for society more broadly. Looking at the second part of your report, how is your proposed gateway different from the current work capability assessment? So at the moment, the work capability assessment, or the WCA, conflates two issues. Firstly, eligibility for a benefit, i.e. is this person eligible to get an income replacement? Um, and secondly, uh, what is this individual's work capability or what's their work capacity? So do they have a health condition? Do they have a disability? Which means that they're either unable to work at all um, for the foreseeable future or um, might be able to engage in some type of activities but, but can't work right now. What that's done is it's meant that people are inadvertently encouraged to show how sick they are rather than to have an open conversation with a health professional, the person doing the assessment, about what they might be able to do um, and, and indeed what they might be able to do with more support. In our model, we split those two things. So we say you should have a single gateway to universal credit, which is, is assessing your eligibility. So actually, are you out of work? Um, do you have savings? All those basic questions you would ask, as well as actually um, building on that and trying to ask a few questions to understand how far someone is from the workplace. So there are international examples where um, they actually ask some questions around things like family, um, qualification level, the sort of level of deprivation in the area you live in, the labour market you live in. So you get a bit more of an understanding of how close that person may be to moving into work. You do that up front and then completely separately later on, if needed, you can do an, an occupational health assessment, which is a positive conversation saying, OK, can this person do some work? What type of work might they be able to do? Could they work part time? And what support do we need to put in place to help them to achieve those goals? So in the final part of your report, you recommend more conditionality for extending conditionality for disabled people. How will this work in practice? So it's really interesting that when employment and support allowance was first introduced by the last Labour government, one of the, the key messages around it was actually we need to have a system which requires more of the people who we are giving benefits to. So actually the then government expected that just a, a small minority of people would be in the group that had no conditionality, i.e. they weren't required to do anything. Actually, if you look at who, at where people are going when they take the work capability assessment, of those people that we actually know what group they go into, almost three quarters are going into the support group where there is no conditionality at all, actually very little help to, um, to support them to move into work. We know about half of those people actually say themselves that they want to work, so this is a really unfortunate situation. What we're saying is actually, if someone's health barrier is the key reason why they're not able to move into work, and actually they have a mild, possibly a moderate condition that with a little bit of, of rehabilitation, a little bit of support, um, they could either learn to manage more effectively um, or they even potentially could treat, then it's actually quite reasonable in the benefit system to ask them to follow a plan that would help them do that. So we're saying that there should be a higher degree of conditionality, that actually we should apply some degree of conditionality to those who, uh, with a set occupational health plan, could move closer to the workplace. But we are saying, and there's a big caveat with that, that actually we need to make sure there's plenty of flexibility in the system for those people who might apply the conditionality. So the employment advisors, we're saying they should be specialists, they should be fully trained in order to understand um, the sorts of health conditions and the impact that those health conditions might have on an individual claimant, and that they should be able to use their discretion when applying um, the conditionality requirements on individuals.